стали больше времени докладчику. Я просто точну его представлять э, немножко раньше. Сколько, как все еще две минуты осталось, да? Вот. Ну, в общем, нет, тут будет просто конфетки. Я думаю, что Сергей Александрович вы все знаете. Вот. Но специальной презентации его как такового не потребуется. Вот. Я хочу только сказать, что, знаете, это большое видите на расстоянии. Так, мы с Сергеем Александровичем столько лет вообще так сказать, может быть, не все знают, что Сережа когда-то был секретарем конкуренции диалога. Вообще говоря, одни один из тех людей, которые соответственно готовили много лет назад, то были середины 90-х годов. Вот. А потом он удрал. Вот. И мы как-то привыкли с ним значит, вот, в диалог, где мы общаться. Вот. Но он как-то уже просто удрал, он удрал и стал там как вот, вот, большого. Вот. Сережа приезжает, приезжает, но ну, думаю, каждый год, кого он сделает приглашенным лектором. Там, ну, 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 вот, там. Человек растет, растет. Его уже приглашают туда, ну, как ты говоришь, ну, другую конференцию, и так смотришь, просто вот, у нас подкоп вообще, если вообще-то приглашенный лектор, уже такого большого международного масштаба, ну, грех его не пригласить. И вот мы в этом году Сережку пригласили, вот, э, еще кучу денег при этом сэкономили, значит, в качестве приглашенного лектора э, на, на диалог. Вот. И, ну, на всякий случай, может быть, кто-то не знает, я хочу сказать, что Сергей Александрович вообще известен многими занятиями в области я могу назвать только несколько. Ну, например, очень важное направление для него – это оценки систем машинного перевода. То есть он довольно много работает с разными компаниями, разрабатывает методики, объективной оценки того, что происходит в этой области, и продолжает этим заниматься. Вот. Другая область, которую он известен, это автоматическое значение технологий, автоматическое создание всяких технологических ресурсов, технологических и прочее. Одна из тем, которая на диалоге уже звучало, с ним связано это автоматическая жанровая разметка, разметка социальных медиа, куча интернета отшили. Да? То есть вот, в этой области он является автором пионерских работ, и когда смотришь какую-нибудь стендовую сессию большой конференции, где занимается жанровой разметкой, там не суждет это написано, что вот такой приветар Сергея Александровича Шарова, там Сергея Шарова. Вот, то есть это такой уровень, который вот, международный конфликт задается в этой области Сережи. А сейчас у него новая тема, это новая тема связана с тем, что его отпустил университет погулять на целый семестр. Вот. И он как бы даром время не теряет, и за это время он переключился на еще одну область, но как бы не говорит, как он раньше, как бы не занимался. И, собственно, сегодня он нам про него расскажет. Это такая очень интересная область, которая многим сейчас важна. Это автоматическое создание языковых описаний, но в его случае это специфическая ситуация, когда они видите близость между языками, но в целом является частью такого больше, большого направление, которое всем интересно, как сделать так, если у вас есть описание одного языка, как бы бесплатно получить описание другого. Вот. Ну, собственно, он нам про это сейчас расскажет. Все, спасибо. Доклад Сергея Александровича называется Deep Learning and Language Adaptation. То есть блок обучения и адаптация к языку. Uh, we have a very, very long tail. 
right? So the top 100 most popular languages, they only cover 85% of the world population. And even in this case, the, okay, quite a substantial portion of the 100 languages is under-resourced. Right? So, uh, to give you one example, Baloch and Kamkani, they are fairly large languages with the number of, na of, of native speakers uh, more than the number of native speakers of such languages as Danish or Tatar, for example, in the, in the Russian context, and at the same time there are no resources for those languages at all. Right? The way we can save the situation is by taking into account the notion of relatedness between the languages. This is a map of the Indo-European languages. So we all know that we have Slavonic languages, Romance languages, Germanic languages, and also Indo-Iranian languages. Actually, Baloch and Kankani are both Indo-Iranian languages. And this is where we can get some information uh, in order to build more resources. Okay? And uh, so, and I was not the first uh, who tried to work on this. So Francis Bacon, uh, he uh, is actually, he was an Englishman uh, who lived in Paris. He wrote in Latin about the grammars of Greek and Hebrew, and he was in a very good position to make this claim. And for those of you uh, who have fairly, fairly arrested knowledge of school Latin, this is, uh, this is actually well illustrated by the translation. Right? So the English translation of this, uh, uh, of this statement is aligned well, we are both on the lexical and on the grammatical level, with the, uh, with the, uh, with the original Latin. Uh, and the, per the person who actually presented this first, the, the way I learned about this representation, is Joachim Niver, who uh, transformed this citation into the form uh, by adding the word annotation, right? So that annotation is important. The similarity between the languages is important, but at the same time, you also need to have the same annotation, and this is uh, the background for his project on, uh, uh, on the universal dependencies. So, at the moment, uh, we have shared annotation for 47 languages, and probably more is coming. The problem is that Baloch and Kankani are still not there yet, but uh, Baloch is related to Farsi, Konkani is related to Hindi, and therefore, in principle, we can try transforming the resources for, for example, for part of speech tagging and for syntactic parsing from better resourced languages such as Farsi or Hindi into, uh, into Baloch and Konkani. Right? And the, uh, so, uh, so this is an example of what we have in the universal dependencies. Uh, the corpora in, in the universal dependencies tree bank, they are reasonably okay, useful for the task of part of speech taking, but at the same time they are quite small. And therefore, in the experiments I am going to show later, I primarily rely on these corpora as a source of annotated data. And on top of this, I also use unannotated data taken from the Wikipedias for the respective languages. And for the machine translation experiment, I work with the set from Autodesk, uh, uh, which is aimed at investigating the post-editing rate uh, in, uh, in various uh, settings. Right? So, these are the corpora, and, and the sizes are in, in the number of words, right? So, for the respective la languages, they are... So, one of the standard slides I, um, I show, which uh, demonstrates the need for bigger corpora, uh, is the use of okay of a word like to break right to break in English is reasonably frequent, but at the same time the, even uh, even in this case the frequency is quite small. But if we want to represent a particular sense of break, such as waves breaking, right? This is a very common uh, sense, but at the same time the sense is something like uh, five examples per ten million words and on the basis, estimated on the basis of the British National Corpus, right? But if we want to translate it into other languages, and this is an example of translating into French, then, uh, then the way we translate this, it depends on the context. Actually, you can think about this also in the Russian context, right? How you translate this, uh, the, the waves break, right? depending on the force, depending on, on the context. And then in French there is even a specific term for the area where the waves break. 
right? So, and if you want to represent this variation, you need much bigger corpora. And this is not available in languages, in, in small corpora like the universal dependencies. At the same time, this is a lexical example. Uh, if we look at the grammatical, uh, so that, uh, at the grammatical examples, then we still have sparsity. And here is an example from uh, Ukrainian and Russian. In the universal dependency set, we have 710 uh, tags for Russian and about 700 also for Ukrainian. Fewer for Ukrainian, not because there are fewer tags in Ukrainian, but because of the the size of the Ukrainian corpus is much smaller, but even in Russian, we also have some single examples of feature combinations, right? So, for example, if we take a participle, then in this, uh, in this case, this particular annotation string occurs only once in the uh, in syntax rules, and this corresponds to, uh, to the uh, uh, participle quality, right? So, uh, so you definitely need much, uh, much more than just the universal dependencies. Uh, uh, tax set for uh, for doing uh, anything useful, right? Uh, including part of speech tag and syntactic parsing. And my oh, that's so that, that this, this is again the rationale for using many languages. Uh, the context for my interest for uh, 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 to this problem is actually okay. It stretches back to the also to the last millennium to the same time when Francis Bacon was writing about the uh, language, uh, the related languages, right? Because my first European project was on generation of instructions and we designed rule-based grammars, a single grammar actually, which covered uh, uh, several Slavonic languages at the same time with the assumption that uh, you have, for example, the, uh, okay, you have a command and this command is typically expressed by an imperative uh, and in Slavonic languages, this is usually the, pl the plural imperative, right? And this is a single rule which covers Bulgarian, Czech, and Russian at the same time. But in the case of agreement between the numeral and the noun phrase which follows it, then this phenomenon exists in Czech and Russian, not in Bulgaria. So this means that we uh, write a rule which exists for Czech and Russian, but it doesn't fire in the case of Bulgaria, right? So then uh, I also had a couple of PhD students who worked on developing electronic resources for, tra for, for training someone who knows a well-known language such as French or Russian in order to read or translate from a, le um, a less known language such as Romanian or Ukrainian. For example, if you have a word net for, you, for Romanian and French, then you can find ways of detecting cognates but more importantly, of detecting um, detecting uh, false friends, right? So that you can read Romanian texts easier. Uh, or the other example is with Russian Ukrainian. Specifically, in this case, we tried to to detect uh, to, uh, without full rhetorical parsing. We tried to uh, to detect changes in argumentation, right? And again, highlight it in Ukrainian and in Russian in order to train someone who reads Russian fluently but uh, needs to, to read Ukrainian in order to find out how, for example, contrast is expressed in a particular language, right? So uh, yet another example is the use of machine translation by a pivot language. So, and we showed that uh, if you have resources for Ukrainian, uh, tra for translation from Ukrainian into German or English, you can produce actually a much better uh, model by using a pipeline, by, trans by using first cognates in order to translate Ukrainian into Russian, and then uh, using more resources available for Russian in order to translate into, uh, into German or English respectively. And this is actually a commonly used approach nowadays, but I think that this is the first paper which outlined the benefits of translation via pivot languages for related languages. Right? Yet another line of research uh, uh, is related to what Chris Brew, I think that he was the pioneer on using part of speech tagging for related languages. So for example, if you have more resources for Spanish or Czech, and then uh, uh, he, uh, he with his students showed that this can be exploited in order to build resources in related languages. And we expanded this approach somewhat uh, for a number of related languages. But the bottom line for all these experiments 
can be expressed in this way, right? You need to find a representation which works well for two languages. And this means that whenever you have some training in one language, you can, if, you, if your representation is right, but then you can do training on one language, and then the resource works in, in the other language, because they, they are both based on the same representation. And nowadays, so that in the past we primarily worked either with the, uh, with the rules or with some kind of symbolic representations, and nowadays in the past uh, three or four years, it became actually much easier because uh, there is the paradigm of learning a new representation, and this is what I am going to show primarily in the uh, in the context of this talk. Right? First of all, machine translation, and specifically the task of machine translation quality estimation. Right? So the point is, uh, you need to you want to know whether your MT output is good or not in the absence of a reference translation. Right? And this task is set up as a quality estimation so that you predict, for, for example, the amount of post-editing needed for this sentence. You don't know how to correct it, but you know that quite a number of changes are probably needed for this sentence, right? And you set it up as a standard machine learning setup, so there are some complexity indicators you know from, from the start that your machine translation engine has problems with the sentence of this, of this particular kind, and again, you, you just find what actually works well in the case. Uh, so you, you select some features which can be extracted easily from the source text, you also have some features from the target text, and you also some, have some features uh, for adequacy, right? So you link the source language and the target language, and you find out how much meaning is preserved in empty output, so for, uh, then, then you can use various uh, methods for this, and recently, uh, people started using semantic similarity by bilingual embeddings, and this is the best, probably, uh, way of, uh, of uh, approaching this problem. But then, then this, all, this, this, is, this is all the standard setup. The problem is that you need quite a lot of data in order to, uh, to estimate quality, right? So uh, you need to ask human translators to correct empty output uh, and, and then to, in order to measure the amount of posterity needed in this case. And for example, in the Autodesk set, you have this, so it is quite substantial, uh, about uh, 500,000 words uh, for each of the languages, but for Slavonic languages, you only have Czech, Polish, and Russian, for example, in the set. And so how do we actually approach this, uh, this problem from the viewpoint uh, of language adaptation, right? And actually, probably I should have mentioned, the reason why I use the term language adaptation is because this is quite similar to the term domain adaptation, right? You have more data in one domain, you have less data in another domain, and you learn how to transfer the classifier, right? And this is precisely what you do in this context. So you have a classifier for Russian, for example, and you want to estimate um, um, quality of Polish MT output. And then okay, you, you can assume that Polish MT output with similar features is likely to be good. The problem is that the feature space in the case of Polish is different, right? Because, so for example, how do we estimate the, okay, the difficulty of the source sentence of translation and as well as the quality of the target sentence, the fluency of, of the sentence? We estimate this by using the language model, and then the exact values of the language model, they vary, right? So the higher the language model, the better output is, but at the same time, it is different in the case, so that the, the values are different in the case of Polish or Russian, right? Or the size of the phrase tables, that's yet another parameter which we can take as a feature, but, but, but all these parameters, they are slightly different in the case of the Polish model, and therefore we can't actually just transfer, just apply the Russian classifier to Polish output, right? And therefore we experimented with a technique which is called self-taught learning. So we adapt the feature space for both Polish and Russian in order to get a representation which works for both languages. So uh, the general setup is that you use unlabeled Russian and Polish data. So this means that this is machine translation output. So we took English Wikipedia and we translated portions of English Wikipedia. Uh, we, we selected portions of this Wikipedia in a way which was similar to the training set for both Polish and... So, okay, so then, then 
for the English part of the Autodesk training set, right? So we selected the sentences from the, from the English Wikipedia, which were similar. We translated them into Polish and Russian, respectively, with our, um, with our Moses base um, MT engine, and we produced lots of unlabeled data, right? So, and then we used uh, the self-taught learning, which is based on autoencoders. Essentially, an autoencoder is a technique for uh, dimensionality reduction. In comparison to other techniques, such as principal component analysis or, uh, or multi-dimensional scaling, the advantage of autoencoders is that PCA pr provides a transformation, but it is linear, right? MDS or uh, self-organized maps uh, or TSNE, they are non-linear, they are good, but at the same time, they don't uh, produce a, a, an easily appliable function which transforms our data in the future, right? So, uh, so and autoencoder provides precisely this. So this is a non-linear, but at the same time learnable dimensionality reduction technique. And so this means that we know how to combine Polish and Russian together, how to detect common variations in our data in both Polish and Russian and to transform this into a single representation. And after that, we can transform our Russian training data and to train a prediction model. But at the same time, because the space is the same, this, we, can, we, can, we can just apply it to transform Polish data, right? And we did this for two language, for two language families. One is for the Romance languages and the other one for the Russian for the Slavonic languages. So this is an example. So if we take this as a baseline, right? We train on Spanish and we test on Spanish. And the correlation in this case is very much state of the art because we didn't improve the feature set, right? So that we used the standard features from, uh, from a tool called Quest and we get correlation on the, uh, with the actual, so the, the task is to predict the post editing rate. Therefore, this is a regression setup. And so we estimate the quality of this regression stuff, for example, by uh, by correlation with the with the actual rate. And then we try what we try. We have a Spanish classifier. We can apply the Spanish classifier directly to our data in Portuguese, Italian, or French. And we get the results in the bottom line. And this is the baseline, right? So that, that we are much lower than what we can get on Spanish. This is not based on the lexicon, right? This is based on the values from the language model or from the similarities in the uh, in the uh, uh, in the uh, bilingual embeddings. So we can do this uh, without doing, and we we can apply the model across the languages uh, because we do not work on the lexical level, right? We work on the level of of features extracted from the uh, from the text, but at the same time, because of the differences in the features uh, uh, in the in the feature spaces, we are not very successful in transforming this model. But at the same time, with STL, with this, with self self learning, by first applying autoencoders, we obtain fairly reasonable numbers. Actually, for for the for Portuguese, we even we we even get the number which is almost the same as the original Spanish baseline, right? So that essentially we don't need any Portuguese training data in order to produce fairly good quality uh, uh, classifier in order to estimate quality of, of machine translation into Portuguese, right? And this works not only for the Romance languages, this also works for the Slavonic languages. So we have the upper baseline for Russian, and again, the correlation is a bit lower because of greater sparsity in Russian data, but still it is fairly reasonable. And then we do the transform uh, the adaptation by uh, applying this model to, to Czech and Polish. And again, for in the case of Polish, we can obtain roughly the same quality of prediction, right? As it was in the uh, as it was in the case of Russian. Again, we don't need any training data for Polish in order to uh, to to uh, obtain failure reasonable classifier, right? And then obviously this is much higher than what is coming from the baseline. And then the power of language adaptation is shown in this last slide. So what if we have our English Spanish model, right? And we apply it to Czech and Polish, right? And we can see that okay, so we can we can do self learning, but because the feature spaces originally between Spanish and either Czech or Polish, right? They are different. Then self-learning does not 
result in a shared space which is useful for learning, so we do not improve in, in, in any single reasonable way uh, between the languages, right? So that this is this uh, this is one example of how language adaptation works. The other example is in the task of detecting cognates. So in the task of detecting cognates, uh, so we want to build a lexicon, and assuming that we don't have a large parallel corpus, and usually a large parallel corpus is not available for a language pair which does not work, uh, which does not, uh, which, which, which is not part of a standard repository, such as uh, the European Parliament or the United Nations, right? You have very reasonable uh, like uh, parallel resources coming from the uh, either from, uh, from the United Nations or from, from the European uh, Union, but uh, but if you want to cross uh, them, then this does not work, right? So that, for example, this is an example for uh, for Czech, Sl Slovenian, and Russian, and also Ukrainian, right? So uh, so uh, and and you don't have resources for producing uh, lexicons across those languages, so. You need to, so at the same time you know that they are similar, right? This is an example of common etymology. So words are coming from the same source, right? Like uh, or they are coming from borrowing, but they are borrowed from the same source and in, in a fairly similar way, right? In some cases, because 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 in the case of either uh, Czech or Slovenian, the uh, borrowing is uh, it is into a different form, right? So this means that you can infer quite reliably from uh, from a comparable resources the translations for uh, for Russian and Ukrainian, but not for uh, Czech or, Sl uh, or Slovenian, right? Then we also need to take account uh, false francs, so that everyone knows that this field is uh, right with false false francs, for example, vredni in Russian and vredni in Slovenian. They have very different meanings. Uh, the other thing is that we also have partial friends, so words which mean the same in some contexts, but not in all the contexts in which the word is used. And ideally, we would like to get rid of them, right, in our dictionary induction procedure. And this is an example. So in Russian, Jana is a wife, and in Slovenian, this can be either a wife or a woman, right, in, in general and we need to get rid of such cases. And finally, also, there is yet another constraint on the cognates, and this is the difference in the frequency. So, for example, uh, if you take the uh, Portuguese word and the Spanish word, uh, referring to drawing, right? They are very close cognates, they mean the same, they are used in roughly the same context, except that one is very, very rare, right? So in the case, uh, in the case of, uh, of the Portuguese word, this this cognate is it, it has the rank and the frequency list from Wikipedia around 100,000 of them. This is way outside of the uh, of the um, frequency list of common words in Portuguese. Okay, and one way of doing this, and actually the, one of the standard ways uh, nowadays, is by using cross-lingual embeddings. So probably you have seen this slide uh, many times before, this, uh, this picture. So you have two representations, uh, two word embeddings for two languages, and you can transform the space uh, from, uh, from, from one language to the other, and then by means of a small seed dictionary. And from this you can infer fairly reasonable quality uh, of translations. Right? So, and then, then first of all, you have monolingual corpora for producing word embeddings, and I used Wikipedia in, uh, in these cases. And then you have a linear transformation, and this is the standard setup. So you have a linear transformation which, uh, which learns a matrix for transforming the English words into a new feature space, right? And you, minimize, you, you learn the matrix in a way which minimizes the, uh, the distance. And, and, and then this is, this is the, 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 the standard technique. So uh, in our case, we, I, I would like to work on as little resources as possible. Therefore, I, okay, and also for language pairs such as Russian and Slovenian or Russian and Ukrainian, you don't have, or Russian and Polish as it is uh, in, uh, in this case, you don't have power resources in order to infer a good quality dictionary. But at the same time, uh, in, in Wikipedia, the uh, articles are interlinked. 
and one easy way of detecting, uh, of detecting reasonable quality translations is by using uh, uh, by using these links as um, as corpora, as parallel corpora, right? So for 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 example, in this case, either between Swedish and or German or or uh, Dutch and German or Russian and uh, Polish. So the okay, one of the problems in using Wikipedia and in using the uh, links uh, between the articles is that they tend to be dominated by uh, by named entities, right? By names of people or places. Uh, so so so. But if you exclude them, then the rest of the list also includes fairly normal words. And then if you do alignment, the task of alignment, word word to word alignment, is actually much easier because you have very short sentences and you know that they are actually very well aligned between each other, right? So. And then from this, you can also so that this is this is the standard setup, right? You you infer the dictionary and you uh, map the uh, the embedded spaces. So what you can do after that? So what you also know that you work with related languages, and therefore you can also learn the distance between the words as one of the constraints or aligning the feature spaces. Uh, on, on aligning the word embedding spaces, right? And here is one example. So if you have Filipino in Swedish and Filipino in German, then, 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 then two operations are needed to map them. You have potentially a problem here, namely that uh, Schlacht and Slaget, they, are, they look similar, but at the same time, the number of edit operations is actually quite high. And therefore, for detecting of cognates, the baseline language line distance is not always good, and therefore I tried to experiment with the with a weighted language line distance. So now, so that first of all, this list in the first instance was produced by aligning the um, the Wikipedia uh, titles, the links between the Wikipedia Wikipedia titles. So essentially, it came from a parallel corpus, word alignment of a parallel corpus. Now, once you have a dictionary. Then you can align this dictionary on the character level, right? And then, then, then from this alignment, you get actually so the, uh, you are uh, um, you get a match between different letters in the uh, in this case on the German side and on the Swedish side, and therefore the amount of alignment actually increases quite considerably, right? Because you know what corresponds to what with much higher precision. What is more, the baseline Levenstein distance. Doesn't, okay, yes, and, and, and then you have, you have the probabilities of, of alignment coming from the character alignment model, right? But, uh, and, then, and, and then you can define the weighted Levenstein distance essentially in exactly the same way. So then, then you had the probabilities for alignments in the first instance between the characters, and then the standard Levenstein distance is computed by the, okay, by the number of edit operations divided by the length of the string. And in the case of this operation, you can uh, uh, you can uh, you can do this between the, uh, the character level alignments, right? The probabilities of the character level alignments. The other advantage is that this also works across the, uh, the character sets because you can't map uh, you you can't map, uh, for example, Polish and Russian because they are based on different character sets, right? In the standard Levenstein model, but in this model, obviously, uh, because you have an alignment. And you have the probabilities for the alignments between the characters, then you can uh, you can get fairly reasonable estimates of how the uh, Latin M is translated into uh, into Russian M, and also what are the substitutes, for example, E, corresponding with what probability it corresponds to O in uh, in the Russian case, right? Okay, so then this is this is this is one addition to the model uh, to the standard model by by Nikola et al. The other addition is uh, the okay. One of the problems in this uh, in, in this large feature space is that so you have again not the feature space but the word embedding space, right? So the word embedding space, in order to match the dictionaries with a reasonable degree of precision, the number of dimensions needs to be large, right? So usually you need to operate with 300 or 500 dimensions uh, because uh, there are so. Uh, 
there are many words and you need to match the meanings of those words, right? And you have more items at the same. So that one of the phenomena in, uh, in multi-dimension spaces is that if, when you work with spaces of hundreds of dimensions, then you have more items which are at the same distance as the number of dimensions grows, right? And the other thing is that there is also a particular phenomenon of hubness, right? So then this means that with a large number of dimensions, sometimes some of the items appear as neighbors for a large number of, uh, of other items, right? And this permeates the embedding space. So, and this is an example, so for, 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 for example, and also this happens quite often with very rare words, right? Okay, or relatively rare words, such as names. So, they tend to be in the vicinity of many other words, especially in the, uh, in the, converted, uh, uh, in the converted embedding spaces. And therefore, so, so, so one of the techniques actually uh, developed by, uh, by uh, Marco Baroni and his students was to use some kind of a correction procedure, right? You know how many friends, how many neighbors a particular item has, and this reduces the position of this item in the ranked list of the candidates, right? Proportionally to the number, to the number of neighbors it has, and therefore, and, and after that, you have actually fewer neighbors, right? Uh, for each individual item, and then this, I can, I can show you later that this, this, this actually helps quite considerably. Right? So, and these are the results. So, uh, so this is this uh, one of the useful test sets has been produced for the for the English to Italian direction. This is not the direction with which I want to work, but at the same time, in order to show the power of the of the method, it is it is much better to work with something which is uh, uh, based on a standard set. Right? And in this particular case, uh, you have, uh, so the, the standard mo model by Nicola et al, it achieves, uh, this is the accuracy in the, in the induction task, right? So, uh, so uh, in this particular case, you have, uh, okay, uh, the original model has, has the accuracy of this kind, and then there is another approach for matching the embedding spaces. By Farouk uh, and Dai, and this is okay. So the, 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 the quality increases somewhat on this space, and uh, and uh, we can see that that global correction helps in this uh, in this context, right? But then, if we add the Lebesgue time distance in addition to the uh, to the global correction method, then we can see a okay, fairly dramatic increase in accuracy, right? In accuracy of our induction procedure. And then, if we add the weighted Lebesgue time distance, then we can see even uh, even greater increase, right? Then, so that, that but then this this works on the basis of the vectors produced by Marco Baroni and his students, right? If you use different vectors, then the result is likely to be different. So that in this particular case, uh, people at Facebook, so that this is the, the same group uh, as Nicole uh, nowadays. Right? They produced new vectors trained on Wikipedia resources and they claim that, that, that this set is better. Actually, this was presented at some point here uh, at, um, yesterday. Okay, I'm trying to remember what was the context in which this was used. But anyway, uh, many of you know about these vectors. And then if you, if you use the fast text vectors, then quality, even the baseline, is actually higher. Right? But then, but then, if you add the weighted limit time distance, then you can achieve something which which looks which looks quite good. So there is a bit of not exactly cheating, but then, then actually the model underperforms in this particular case because I work in this uh, in this particular example between English and Italian, and English and Italian they are reasonably close, especially given that it, uh, English borrowed quite a number of words from Latin. But at the same time, they are not closely related languages, right? And the emphasis of my talk is to work with closely related languages. And now, what I did, I, so then, then I went through the test set, or uh, as as used by Dino et al. And I only left in the test set only the items which were actual uh, cognates between English and Italian. And this again showed fairly dramatic uh, increase. So that if you work even between English and Italian, if you want to induce a dictionary, then the quality of the dictionary and this 
this is uh, accuracy at one, so that, that the equivalent, the first, the best equivalent, the nearest neighbor in the, uh, in the space as suggested by this method. Okay, in 70% of the cases, this, this is right, right? And this is, this is a fairly dramatic increase in comparison to what was uh, the baseline as, um, as used by Nico Fatal, right? But then if you work with related, with languages which are really related, Right, and this is an example. So that just a reminder uh, that for English, without language time distance, we have the accuracy of about 60% uh, uh, um, and about 70% with weighted language time distance. Right, and if we work across the Slavonic languages, then the accuracy is usually much better. Right, so even without the weighted language time distance, we work with a much better baseline. Right, and with the precision at one, I also mentioned precision at ten. Precision at ten means that among the ten nearest neighbors for the for the item in question, we have the right translation. Right, so that I, in some contexts, precision at ten is actually uh, also a useful measure. And then, so that the, so that if the, these numbers are without uh, the use of weighted language time distance, if we add weighting. Uh, for the uh, for the character sets, but then we get the results at least so that even even at precision at one is already it looks okay, fairly usable, right? Precision at ten uh, is nearly perfect, right? So we, 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 we can all almost always we can be sure that we can gain something uh, useful out of this, right? So that this is uh, definitely a success, except that. There are also potentially problems with this, and uh, so one problem is that when you work on the basis of lemmas, the task is actually easy, right? So, so this word "maladie" and "malatia" for French and Italian, they are close translation equivalents, and at the same time, they are also quite close in terms of their language time distance, and we can predict very reliably that they are translations of each other. Right? But if we start working with the uh, with the full forms, then and if we add so that in the case of French and Italian, we only have two forms, single and plural, right? And the plural form for French and Italian, right? They are formed in different ways. And now you can see that the ending, for example, for the Italian form, it is surprisingly similar to the singular form in the case of French, right? And for the task, if you want to induce a machine translation model then this machine translation model needs to be right on the level of forms, right? Because you don't want to translate uh, what was in French, for example, uh, singular into something which is plural in Italian, right? Ideally, you want to avoid this. And this is even a greater problem in the case of Slavonic languages. This is an example for matching between Russian and Ukrainian, right? Quite often you have different forms. So in this particular case, as you can see, in Russian, uh, in for the Russian feminine forms, uh, there, so that the, the practically all the uh, all the oblique cases are okay. They have the same ending, right? And they are different in the case of Ukrainian. But vice versa, the masculine forms they are almost the same in the case of Ukrainian, but they are different in the case of Russian. Right? And this is one bit which is actually missing in this model, and this is what uh, we tried to address in our most recent research so far without, uh, okay, without, without results. <laughs> but the other thing is that, again, so if you, if, if you want to work with full forms, then there is a problem with step alterations, right? Because uh, if you match the, okay, so then, then there is no difference in the forms between Russian and Ukrainian here, if you take, uh, if you take uh, the genitive form, right, and you match the genitive form from Russian into Ukrainian, but if you take the dative form from, uh, and, and you want to transform it from Russian into Ukrainian, then, uh, then the changes are much more considerable, right, because the changes are not only in the endings, but, but also in the forms, and so you need to combine a morphological model with the with the model which is based on uh, on word debating spaces, right? And finally, the task of part of speech tagging and named entity recognition, right? So uh, so that's this is this is an example from uh, German and Dutch, right? So if you have a sentence in German and this is taken from the Dutch. 
from the Dutch universe of the dependency three bands, right? But then the sequence of words is roughly the same, and the part of speech tags assigned to those words are roughly the same, and if, and then this is the basis for the delexicalization technique. So the term delexicalization is the term used by Madonna et al., but at the same time, this is the same technique as used by uh, Chris Brew and his students, right? Uh, much, much, much earlier on. And then if you transform this into Russian, then, then exactly the same sentence, if you translate this into Russian, then it is still failure. Okay, so there are some, uh, some differences in the way how the auxiliaries, for example, work in, in, uh, in, in Dutch and German on the one hand and in Russian on the other hand, but, but, but overall the sequence here, okay, uh, only has minimum changes, right? So that if you have Dutch and German, then there are no changes at all. Uh, in the case of Russian, there are changes. In the case of Chinese, the changes are much more dramatic, right? So that you can't assume that uh, the sequence remains the same. And again, this speaks about the importance of the similarity between the languages on the typological level. Yet, in, uh, then th this is the basis for the delexicalization technique, right? You forget about the lexical, the exact uh, lexical words as they are used in each individual language, and you concentrate on the uh, on the sequences of tags, or on the sequences of uh, or on the structure of the tree in the case of part of speech, uh, in the case of semantic of syntactic parsing. Right? The other technique is based on parallel corpora, so you have parallel corpora which are word aligned, and then you induce the matching between the source and the and, and the target language, and this is uh, this is a lexicalized a lexicalized model. I will show you later how the two models perform in the context of uh, named entity recognition, right? And then in principle you can even induce a model by using machine translation, right? And again, between related languages this probably produces better models than, uh, uh, in, uh, than in the case when the languages are fairly far apart. And this is what we tried to do. So what I showed you before is that we can actually produce fairly reasonable sets of cognates between languages such as Russian and Ukrainian, and this is the, this is the context in which we have a Russian uh, tree, and, the, and we can transform this into the uh, into the Ukrainian tree just by having the same tree, the same part of speech text, but 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 the uh, forms they are based on the um, on the cognates, right? So uh, there are problems with this model as well because this is this is probably um, a nice example. So you don't actually transform a model from Ukrainian into Russian, but then this was this was a nice example we, which we found. Then okay, it looks it looks all right except that Nykrashe is okay. We know all okay if we speak Russian, we all understand what it means, but the form in Russian is different. But then uh, Robert, it can be actually quite similar to Ukrainian in the sense of work but then it doesn't necessarily mean, mean the same thing, and then this is again somehow similar, but then this doesn't work because the actual meaning is that this is best done in motion, so then, because, and then again, so then the, this is because of the uh, alteration in the stem, so that then probably we can assume that the word motion or movement in, in Ukrainian ruk, it, uh, it changes uh, in the, uh, in the locative case, right? So then, and this is, this is obviously so. A model which is based on relaxation can't solve all the problems, but at least it, pro it produces something which is uh, which is which is useful, right? So the other problem is uh, how we represent ambiguity, lexical ambiguity in embeddings. Again, so then the, this is this is this, this is a problem. But but overall, so once if we can transform our our Russian text into Ukrainian and uh, replace all the word forms with the all the word forms with the with their cognates, or in, in the case when the, when we have a small dictionary of function words which we, which can't be transformed by using cognates, uh, then uh, then 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 we can do the training, and this is how we did again a very simple model uh, which is based on uh, on hidden markup models TNT. So then then what we so that the, the previous model uh, obtained accuracy for tagging around 95 percent. And after the transformation, the new model for Ukrainian, without any training resources on Ukrainian, it obtained a fairly reasonable, fairly acceptable accuracy of 92%, right? So then, then this, is, this speaks of the power of adaptation of this kind. And then, but then, this was based without, so the embeddings, they were produced 
by means of uh, uh, by means of neural methods, right? But then the tagging was done in the standard way. And the last experiment I wanted to show it is based on name and entity recognition. And this time it was based on neural methods. And the assumption behind the neural methods is that okay, this this comes initially from neural language models, right? So in a language model, you need to predict the next word. And then, uh, so uh, Karpaty quite famously showed that if you train a character level network on the uh, on um, okay on, on text from Shakespeare, then you can produce a text which looks fairly like Shakespeare. It doesn't not have any um, it doesn't make any sense, but at the same time, it is fairly reasonable, right? So uh, and then neural machine translation, if you can predict words in one language, uh, then you can predict words in another language if you train your model in the right way. And in exactly the same way, if you train your model to predict the next part of speech tag, or it is as it is in the case of the next slide, the named entity tag, then you can uh, you can be quite successful. Right? So this is the case of uh, name and entity recognition. You have annotation in which some words such as names, so that this text is in Slovenian. I will tell you why it is in Slovenian later. So, uh, so, so this text is in Slovenian. It has uh, so the name of the book. Is, okay, it, it has the miscellaneous name and entity tag, and the uh, the person has uh, has another tag. And quite recently, actually at the last NACO, uh, there was an, uh, a neural network model which was quite successful. Uh, it, 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 is, it, is, it is a fairly standard LSTM which was combined with CRF on top. And it produced one of the best results in the, in the field for English. And what I had at that time, I had, okay, I had a training corpus for Slovenian. And this is why the example is coming from Slovenian. And also, I showed you in the uh, uh, in the previous part of my slides how successful we can be in matching the embedding spaces, right? So, and I, so essentially, the neural network model uh, it works with the embedding spaces, and if you can transform the embedding spaces from Russian or Czech or Polish into Slovenian, then effectively you can train on. Check uh, or on, sorry, you, you can train on Slovenian because that was the only focus which was available, and then you can uh, you can apply this model to other languages, and this is, so then and in the so that that okay I I was invited to be a keynote speaker at the Balto Slavonic Natural Language Policy Conference, and they had a shared task, and I thought okay, what so so how my methods can work in this uh, in the case of this task and so essentially I tried to apply it to the uh, to their task and then so the other participants were uh, they uh, the, there was an SVM tagger which was based as I mentioned on projections. They had Europol or United Nations corpus and they projected the text from English into uh, into all the Slavonic languages which took part in this task and then this worked and the other one was coming from the Joint Research Center of the European Commission and they essentially, this was, this was just based on gazetteers. They uh, collected a very a large amount of lists for, uh, for, of named entities in, in all the Slovenian languages and they applied it. And surprisingly, this very simple model, and they had two test sets, one for the European Commission and another one for Trump, and in a sense, so that, that this simple model, which was just training on Slovenian and testing on all the languages, so Czech, uh, Croatian, Polish, Russian, Slovenian, and Ukrainian, and it was quite quite successful. There was a drop for for Russian and Ukrainian for, for the obvious reasons, because the, so that in the case of this model, because uh, okay, so Russian and Ukrainian are much further away from Slovenian in comparison to other Slovenic languages. And then there was, I didn't have a model which transformed directly from Ukrainian into Slovenian. So I first transformed this, the uh, embedding space from Ukrainian into Russian, and then the Russian space was transformed into Slovenian. And then this explains the drop in the case, uh, in the case of uh, Ukrainian, right? But still, this is, this, is, this is quite reasonable on the European Commission task. And then, in a sense, the European Commission task was related to the Europal course, which was used uh, for training by the by the uh, John Hopkins University team, and then in the case of the mismatch between their domain and the domain of uh, of news about Donald Trump, uh, we can see that, that that this very simple model can okay 
can beat the state of the art which was uh, which was available at the time, right? So then, then this shows the power of language adaptation. And uh, so, okay, I will probably skip a closer discussion uh, of the problems with the transfer between Slovenian and Croatian, because in the case of Croatian, I also had a, a, a test focus and and I. I, I was able to investigate how this works, but okay, I can I can just so in case someone is interested in how Slovenian immigration work, then, uh, then 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 we can speak. Uh, okay, we can uh, we can talk about this later. So what I want to say is the okay just about philosophy, right? So that what was in the past? In the past, we tried to design rules, and this 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 was a handmade task, right? So we tried to work. With, uh, with rules, right? And the, the advantage of rules is that they capture human intuition and knowledge. We know how agreement is expressed in, uh, in, uh, in Czech and in Russian, and we express this by writing rules. The problem is that you need quite a lot of rules to write, and also uh, the okay, interaction between the rules needs to be taken into account. But then machine learning came, and machine learning uh, actually saved us from the need of writing rules, we still had to have some kind of reasonable feature spaces. And again, so we, uh, we saw a number of examples uh, in this conference how a feature space can be designed and uh, in, in a reasonable way. And then, but after that, once we have a feature space, then we apply an algorithm. And the algorithm is a black box. So a black box in the sense that we know how it works, but there, there is no connection between choosing a particular algorithm and the task you want to work with. Right? So then, then how to choose, so you don't know whether to choose random forest or SVM before applying machine learning to a particular task, you need to try both and then you see whether, whether they work. In, in exactly the same way, all the hyperparameters, such as in the case of, uh, of, of, of SVM, they need to be just, just tried out, you need to find out what is the best combination of the hyperparameters, right? And so then, 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 then this was some kind of, uh, okay, uh, we, we tried losing meaning. Right? So, and then this was uh, represented in two quotes, which I, I, I like. One quote by Fred Yelinek. So, every time I fire a linguist, the performance of his uh, uh, speech recognition system goes up. And then a bit later, only can the church actually show that you can fire everybody and buy more data. Right? <laughs> what he showed was that, okay, he showed this in the context of a couple of tasks. So, then you have, uh, you, have a, um, you have a task and you have a baseline algorithm, and you design a clever algorithm, right? And a clever algorithm on this task beats the, the baseline of those things. But if you double the amount of data, then the baseline usually, actually, what he showed in all the cases, the baseline on double data, on double amount of data, beats the clever algorithm, or, which was trained on the, on the original amount of data. Obviously, the clever algorithm beats the baseline again, more data, but at the same time, you invest quite a lot of efforts, and, okay, in, in, in the context of commercial property money, into building the clever algorithm. Just double the amount of data, and you will produce a better result, right? Don't pay attention to, uh, to anything else. And then, this relates very nicely to the recent trend of, uh, of neural networks and deep learning. And this is yet another nice quote by uh, Neil Lawrence, uh, and only is a kind of a rabbit in the headlines waiting to be flattened by the deep learning steam train, right? And then the, the thing is that deep learning relies on more data, right? You want to work with as much data as possible in the context of deep learning, and but then when you do this, then there is magic. Nothing is interpreted, right? Because in, uh, in, uh, uh, in deep learning, everything is a black box, right? So that usually all the feature engineering, so that the, the, the word, the notion of feature engineering is treated as a dirty word, right, in the context, uh, in the context of neural networks. And this is, so that then, this is, this is a problem. So what I want to, what I want to show you is a nice picture, probably, this is the best example I have seen. Can you see it? Yeah. No, or is it, is, is it too, too dark? Because, because it, it looks fine on the computer screen, but, but from, so from what I see, it is a bit too dark. So, okay, so watch this film, right? In this film by Terry Gilliam, uh, the main character is a researcher who uses neural networks to study chaos, right? And he is also obsessed with the meaning of life, with finding meaning in life, right? And he is more successful in learning 
uh, in, in using deep learning, in using neural networks to study chaos, then and he fails in finding meaning. And I think that this is a very nice metaphor for what we are doing at the moment, and then an antidote to this picture is actually so that okay. So uh, so what I want to show is the so okay. On the one hand, the reason why everyone is using neural networks is because is because they are uh, again as practitioners of neural networks show they are unreasonably effective, right? So at the same time, there is quite a lot of hype about this, right? The term deep learning in itself it implies something which is deep, but at the same time, it is most of the time much more shallow, right? We don't design features, we just use uh, words or strings of characters most, most of the time. So it's much more shallow and then also uh, long waiting times, right? So we often win by a very small margin, right? So then, then again, we, we saw many, many examples in this conference when people applied neural network methods and they increased the performance of the system by one tenth or more the percent, right? At the same time, if we remember Ken Church, is that don't spend time on designing new uh, neural network algorithms. Just buy more data and, and, and it will solve the problem. And But then, the counter, what is the problem with the approach of buying more data is what I mentioned earlier. Language is a large number of right events. And th this, this essentially means that by buying more data, by doubling the amount of data we have, we, have, we obviously capture more phenomena, but at the same time, we also have a problem with, 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 with the very, very long tail of other phenomena we, we, we have kept, captured yet. And then, this is also the reason for actually my interest to one short learning. If you take an example of Marco Barone's one again, Marco Barone was in this room, okay, I think that three or four years ago, and he presented his work on this, and he used the example of one and I think that everyone knows what Pampimuk is nowadays, right? And from seeing this, this single example, and then, then, then you didn't need thousands of examples from the game. So if you train a neural network, a good rule of thumb is to have 1,000 of examples of something in order to learn it reliably, right? You saw only one example of Pampimuk and it was enough for you, right? So that's, uh, that's, that's, the other thing is that, okay, so what, so, on the, okay, I'm trying to rubbish neural networks. At the same time, what I showed you before is the success in, uh, in using, uh, in using neural networks in, uh, in, in practically all the applications I tried it with. And then one of the reasons for this comes from the simple integration of data with neural networks, right? Because it's easy to create shared representations. So then, 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 then this, okay, one of the points of neural networks is to learn a representation, right? And then if you force the representation to be learned in the way which is, uh, which is shared between the languages, then just train in one language and test on the other language. And the other thing is that the place for linguistics in what I see it is you need to define what is shared and what, what so that the sharing is easy, but what is shared? And then investigating, so for example, which phenomena are shared between uh, in, uh, between Czech and Russia, Russia and Ukraine, and this can lead you to a, okay, in what I think a more powerful model. And this is the last bit I want to mention. So thank you very much. Uh, 
Okay, no, then, then, then in, in a sense, it was one of the, uh, one of the same problem. So then, then the, the thing is that if you have a, so, so, so you, uh, you learn a similarity, right? And the similarity between the Russian, so that if you take, uh, if you go back to the, uh, to the, sorry, to the, probably this was towards the end, the top of the, yes, was here, right? So then, then, uh, uh, over here. So, as essentially, the, the problem is that ideally you want to match the, uh, the Russian world, right, to the Ukrainian world, even with the same, with the same part of speech tag. At the same time, the model is based on the so the, it is so the, the the way I learn a new bilingual embedding space is based on a combination of a of the of this of of, uh, of the similarity between between, uh, between the words in the seed lexical, but also on the similarity of their uh, of uh, their uh, uh, orthographic representations, right? So then, and in this model, so then, and the reason why I use this, and I show that this is a very powerful technique, right? If you use uh, the similarity between the orthographic representations, then this helps enormously, okay? So, and, but, then, this is the case, the case of stem alteration. This is one of the examples, uh, and the other thing is the, the difference in the endings, right? So this is one of the examples when more changes are introduced, and therefore, the, they, therefore, the model which is based on the uh, on the orthographic similarity fails. For example, in this particular case, you have Ameriki, which man, which which matches the Ukrainian word quite well. But if you have the dative form, right, then the dative form is much more similar to the genitive form as well, right. And therefore, the closest equivalent for the dative form in Russian is the genitive form in Ukrainian, and this is the problem. Okay, in exactly the same way, this, this is a problem in the case of French and Italian. Again, I can't get, so, so it is very useful to have the orthographic similarity as one of the parameters in my model, but at the same time, this means that the closest equivalent for the French quality in this case will be the plural from Malatia, which is again wrong. Okay, so the, 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 the problem is introduced by the use of orthographic similarity. And this is this is where the model fails. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, your impressive talk and impressive numbers. Uh, the question uh, about mandate recognition: uh, Did you train uh, mandate recognizer on uh, check data, or I, I didn't quite understand what. Uh, what kind of uh, train set did you use, yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, how did you use uh, uh, transferring to another language to transfer this embedding? Right. Okay, so, uh, so, so essentially what I used, uh, this, was, this, was, this, was, this was a quick and dirty experiment. I was, uh, I was really impressed how successful it was, right? So the, model, so the, the model is based on learning on Slovenian data, right? Because this is the only, so, okay, in addition to Slovenian, there was also a Croatian focus, but, but I didn't use it. I used it only for, for testing and for finding out what, what was wrong with the model, right? So I only used the Slovenian model. And the Slovenian model is learned in the embedding space for Slovenian, right? But at the same time, I took all the other languages, Czech, Croatian, Polish, Russian, Slovenian, and Ukrainian, and I matched them into the Slovenian uh, embedding space. And therefore... By, by words. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. For, for, for all the words, all the words uh, uh, went, uh, went into, that, into that space. Right? And after that, the model with the... Uh, so, uh, so I applied the Slovenian model, but with the, with, with the words coming from the embedding spaces from, for those languages. And then, then as, as you can see, it, this, uh, this was quite, quite successful. So you have just uh, word embeddings and didn't train other uh, layers. No, because because I didn't have I didn't. Okay, so in principle I know that there is a name and entity recognition task for Russian as well, but it is di distributed in a very strange format, so it was not uh, compatible with anything else. So that uh, the Slovenian model is in the Conel format, and, and therefore uh, I was able to use it. And, uh, no, for all other languages I didn't. 
to any training data. I only used I, I only used what I extracted from the uh, the embedded models I extracted from the Wikipedia's. Ну, есть время еще на один короткий вопрос. Коллеги, на этом время пришло к концу. Поблагодарим докладчика.